the sound room all the way down and still one verse to go all right let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we saw just a few moments ago Exodus chapter 7 today we're looking at verses 8 through 13 rattlesnake for lunch part 2 rattlesnake for lunch part 2 now in quick review you recall that last week we picked up with the third issue found in our text in the first seven verses and that was the question see I have made thee a god to Pharaoh and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet and we asked what did God mean by that and why is it important and we saw that there are at least three pagan possibilities that are possible in that text when God said that to um, Moses there was first the possible issue did God only mean that Pharaoh would think of Moses like one of his petty pantheon of Egyptian gods that's a possibility secondly since Pharaoh probably knew that Moses was the son of Pharaoh's daughter does that mean that he thought of Moses as one of the divine Pharaoh children who claimed to be gods and that's a possibility or third was God saying that the Greeks were right who threw or who thought that the gods came down had relations with women who produced half God half human offspring with certain supernatural powers and of course that's a possibility and we gave an example out of the New Testament where the priest of Jupiter tried to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas that was in Acts chapter 14 and so was that what God meant when he said I have made you a God to Pharaoh now those were clearly pagan Greeks and pagan Greek concepts and pagan Egyptian concepts concerning gods coming down to men but we saw that in scripture there are some biblical references that make this a biblical statement that God is telling to Moses here first we looked at Psalm 82 you recall that last week the key verses were verses 6 and 7 I have said ye are gods it's God speaking I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes God was clearly referring to men in verse 7 when he said ye are gods but we know that it was men because he told them that they would die that was verse 7 and then we looked at Exodus chapter 22 which deals with all kinds of civil and criminal acts that are to be brought before the judges whom God would appoint over Israel and that passage ended with these words and application in verse 28 remember speaking about judges it says thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people the word gods being used there was referring to human judges and when it's used this way it refers to someone who is appointed to a position of authority by a divine oath the word translated gods in these texts is Elohim it's a plural word not a singular word but it is a word used for God himself and one of the ways in which we can determine the Trinity and the multiplicity of persons in the Godhead the word gods is Elohim it's not Jehovah here or any of the other words that describe the divine nature character or attributes of God we saw that this use where the word is used of a divinely appointed human judge was how the Apostle Paul understood the word gods in Acts 23 in Acts 23 Paul quoted that passage we just read in Exodus 22 28 when he stood before the high priest the God ordained judge who was the head of the God ordained Supreme Court of Israel the Sanhedrin Acts 23 verse 1 Paul earnestly beholding the council said men and brethren I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day and the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. Now everything Paul said there was true. God would someday smite Ananias. Ananias was a whited wall. Ananias was sitting to judge Paul according to the law, but commanded him to be smitten contrary to the law. But they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest. In other words, they knew civil procedure they knew the rules of court they knew what was necessary to say and not to say in that particular court of law and any attorney who goes into a court of law knows that there are some local rules that he must follow if he wants to get his case across in that particular court then said Paul I wish not brethren that he was the high priest for it is written and here he is quoting Exodus 22 28 
which says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. He knew his Bible. Jesus quoted those same passages, the one out of Psalm 82, Exodus 22, against the Jews who wanted to accuse him of blasphemy. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. They understood what Jesus was claiming. There are so many people today who don't get that. There are so many people today who say, Well, you know, he's not really God. He's just sort of like a, a super angel or something. I mean, that's Jehovah's Witnesses or, or the Mormons. You know, you're on your way to becoming a God. They understood that he was making himself out to be God. Jesus answered them, it's not, Is it not written in your law, law? I said, Ye are gods. He's quoting Psalm 82, 6. He's referring to Exodus 22, 9 and 28. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. There's Jesus saying it. Anybody who thinks Jesus never said it, there it is. Now, we studied this in detail. Jesus is both God and man, and has been ordained and appointed as a priest and a judge with an oath by the Father himself. Remember, the priests and judges of Israel stood in the place of God when they were executing judgment. They stood in the place of God when executing judgment. We see that Jesus was made a priest with an oath. That's Hebrews chapter 7. I won't read the entire passage, just the first couple of verses. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. And then we get down to the end, verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated for evermore. We see that he is made the judge as well. We know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And we know that's the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus said so in John chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Therefore they sought to take him, but he escaped out of their hands. He is the divinely ordained high priest and divinely ordained judge. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. We spent a great deal of time looking at that last week. We also learned that there's a second reason in the New Testament why this idea of rulers acting in the place of God is important. When God ordains those in authority, Rebellion against those who have been ordained to authority is direct rebellion against God. Therefore, Pharaoh's rebellion here in our text against Moses is actually direct rebellion against God because God put Moses over Pharaoh when he issued that command, let my people go. We're going to see later as we get farther into the book of Exodus, the children of Israel begin to rebel against Moses. And Moses says to him, you know, you haven't rebelled against us. You've rebelled against God. They're complaining about Moses. They don't say a thing about God. But Moses points out to them, when you rebel against us, you are rebelling against God because God's the one who put us here. Some very serious consequences to that, and we'll get to that as we get a little farther down in the text. But Pharaoh's rebellion against Moses here is actually direct rebellion against God because God put Moses over Pharaoh when he issued his command, let my people go. Moses, the messenger, stood in the place of God when he spoke to Pharaoh. That's clearly, as we saw last week, what Paul means in Romans 13. I'm going to read that again because it's a point that we often willfully reject. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. That's rather blunt. Resisting those whom God has put in positions of authority is actually resisting God himself. Now, we always want to know the reasons why we don't have to obey those in authority. But the emphasis, as we saw last week of the New Testament, is we must learn to obey. 
We've already previously in multiple messages detailed and listed the specific things in which we do not have to obey the government or for that matter any other authority at work or in the family or in the church. But unless one of those specific biblical principles comes into play, the bottom line is obedience. And we noticed last week that Paul uh, makes application to one of our most unfavorite things in the whole world of doing, which is paying taxes, but he says we still have to obey. It's always better to obey late than never to obey. And he gives two reasons for this in Romans 13. Number one, suffering the wrath of the government when you get caught. And number two, for your conscience sake. It's hard to live with a guilty conscience. If you can live with a guilty conscience, it means that you have sinned for so long and you've oppressed your conscience for so long that you've seared it. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, 1 Timothy 4. That in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. That's the end result of what's going to happen when you have a seared conscience. You're going to leave sound doctrine. You're going to depart from the faith. You're going to begin to listen to demonic teaching. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They'll no longer be able to tell the difference between true doctrine and false doctrine. They'll no longer be able to tell when it is the leading of the Spirit of God and when it is the leading of the devil. Having a seared conscience, folks, is a very serious issue. So how important is obedience in the eyes of God? We closed last week with eight reasons that obedience is essential in the eyes of God. Number one, you were given grace and a spiritual gift so that you would obey. That means it is possible, Romans 1.5. Obedience proves who is your master. That's number two. Regardless of what you proclaim with your mouth, obedience is what proves that you are the, who is your master. That's Romans 6.16. Number three, obedience is the deciding factor in your testimony to the lost. Failure here, that is failure to obey God, means that you have no testimony before a watching world. Number four, genuine uh, faith always results in obedience. Always, genuine faith always results in obedience. Do you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk? That's Romans 16, 26. Number five, obedience begins in your thought life. What, you, what do you think about when your mind is idle? My mom and dad used to say an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Obedience begins in your thought life. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing e into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Number six, both obedience and disobedience always have consequences. You will pay a price. That's 2 Corinthians 10.6. Number seven, Jesus Christ set the example and learned obedience by suffering. And he is the one we are to follow. That's Hebrews 5.8. And finally, the end result of sanctification is obedience. In other words, that's one of the proofs of spiritual growth in your life. If you're not obedient, it means that you're not growing spiritually. That's number eight. Now that brings us to today. How is obedience the key to a rattlesnake lunch? How is obedience the key to a rattlesnake lunch? That's in Exodus 7, verses 8 through 13, which we read just a moment ago. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so. Notice and they did so. They followed exactly what God told them to do. Did you notice that there are five things that God told them to do? As you read that through, uh, most of us just sort of have the idea, yeah, they're supposed to go into Pharaoh and throw down this stick. You know, it'll become a snake. But there are five specific things that God told them to do here in this text. And they did it. They did so as, that is in the same way that God told them to do it, as the Lord had commanded. Now, look at obedience in our text, which ties us in with what we studied last week. Precise obedience is the key to what happens next. God doesn't just give general commands, although he does give many general commands that are to cover lots of different areas, like flee fornication or don't steal. Those are general commands. But he also gives some very precise and specific commands. The first thing that we notice in the text is that God gave five very specific commands to Moses. If Moses had not learned to follow directions precisely, he would have been in very hot water. Are you aware of the fact that sloppy obedience is never okay? You know, good enough for government work. 
Well, I sort of generally did what you wanted me to do. You understand that that's exactly what Saul did. Saul was obedient 99%. Saul always obeyed God almost. When God told him to go out and kill all the Amalekites, Saul went out and killed most of the Amalekites, but he saved one alive. Saul was supposed to kill all the animals, but Saul saved the best ones alive. And Samuel came to him and says, why have you not obeyed God? God gave you a very precise instruction. He said, oh, I did. I, I obeyed God. Samuel says to him, then what meaneth the lowing that I hear in my ears? All those moos and bleats in the background over there. Uh, oh, well, uh, I have a good spiritual reason for doing it. Oh, really? Oh, yes, I, I saved those to give sacrifice to the Lord your God. Really? To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken on the fat of rams. But you say, but he killed all of them except Agag. Yeah. And so Samuel called for Agag to come out and Samuel took the sword and he hacked him in pieces. And then Samuel says to Saul, because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord, God's jerking the kingdom out of your hand. God expects precise obedience. Sloppy obedience is never good enough. Partial obedience is never good enough. God gave some very specific and precise commands that we're going to look at here that Moses and Aaron did. They did it exactly the way that God told them that they were supposed to do it. Number one, first, you notice that God told them not to take any action until Pharaoh gave a very specific command. Quote, when Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, show a miracle for you. Now, you know, when Moses came into Pharaoh's court, there would have been various words spoken in the formalities of the court, just like if you go into any court today. There are various formalities that are spoken. But all the introductory comments and all the formalities here, as far as God is concerned, are irrelevant. Because there's going to be a precise timing, there's going to be a precise key to what brings on the snake story. What brings on this business about the snake show. Moses was not to perform any action until he heard the specific words, show a miracle for you. First thing. Second, did you notice that God didn't say to him, okay Moses, and when, Moses, and when Pharaoh says that to you, you can say anything you want. Or when Pharaoh says that to you, say, oh baby Pharaoh, you want to see a miracle? Believe me, Pharaoh, I'm going to show you a miracle right now. He tells him, don't speak to Pharaoh. He says, speak to Aaron. Speak to Aaron. You know, that might have been sort of insulting. Instead of saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, we'll do it. Just as you said, sir. He doesn't. He says, speak to Aaron. You're not speaking to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to give you this command. When you hear these words, this is what you're going to do. You're going to speak to Aaron. Third, rather interesting, God gives you specifically what to say to Aaron. He didn't say to him, then you can discuss the problem with Aaron, and then you can say to Aaron, well, let's see if this thing will work now. <laughs> Remember, Aaron had never thrown down his own rod before. Moses had, but not Aaron. Don't discuss the problem with Aaron. You will give a command to Aaron. Remember, you are my spokesman to God. You stand in my place as you speak to Pharaoh. Aaron will be like a prophet for you, but you will be God to Pharaoh. Rather important that Moses does what God commands? I think so. Fourth, and this is very important, look at your text. The command will relate to Aaron's rod not to your rod. Now Moses already knew that his rod could become a serpent at the word of God. He had, he had that experience. But now God is going to use Aaron's rod to show that God is not limited to using one man only. 
It's an important lesson for all of us to learn, for me especially. God is going to show Moses that he's not limited to only using Moses. God keeps us from getting proud by showing how easily he can use someone else if we wander from his commands and from his ways. Now, you know, as we look farther into the Old Testament, we discover that God will still use the rod of Moses to part the Red Sea in the future. God will still use Moses' rod to strike the rock and cause water to come forth. God will still use Moses' rod that is held over his head, supported by Aaron and Hur, that gives victory over the Amalekites. You know, Hur is a very interesting person. I wish we had time to do a character study on him, but he appears to be the assistant of Aaron, just like Joshua was the assistant of Moses. You remember the incident in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 and following. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Moses' rod is the only one that's ever called the rod of God. Aaron's rod is never called the rod of God. I will stand with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses said unto him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now Moses' hands were heavy. Can you imagine standing with your hands over your head for, say, 14 to 16 hours? How long can you stand with your hands over your head? Moses was a human being. He was a tough old man. I mean, he, he started on this process when he was 80 years old, lived to 120, and it tells us that at the end of that time, his eye was not dim, nor, nor his uh, step was not halted at all. I mean, he was as strong at age 120 as he was back there in his 40s. But he got tired. He was human, just like you and me. Doesn't matter how strong you are, you will get worn out. You need help. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do you understand now why God cursed Saul so much in that incident I just recounted? He had failed to kill the king of the Amalekites. And God said, I'm going to wipe out Amalek. Do you know how else he failed? There must have been some other people that he didn't get. Because when we get to the book of Esther, Haman is there the Agagite. You know, we have some problems, folks, when we don't obey. It may run down a few generations into the future, and it may be something that brings a curse later on and great pain and suffering to God's people when we don't obey precisely what God has told us to do. I will utterly put out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Her, the assistant of our servant, the minister, it says here, of Aaron. You know, it's interesting as you read through uh, ancient history, her is mentioned. Did you know what Josephus says about her? Josephus says that Hur was the husband of Miriam, the big sister of Moses and Aaron. So he was the brother-in-law of Moses and Aaron. Interesting, when you begin to study, who in the world were these people? I know most of you probably saw years ago that movie, Ben-Hur. And there is somebody in the Bible called Ben-Hur, son of Hur. But um, anyway, Exodus 24, 12. Hur finds another very interesting location in Exodus 24. The Lord said unto Moses, Come up unto me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. So here's Moses going up to get the, the Ten Commandments. And Moses rose up, and his minister, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come down unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. 
And Moses went up into the mount, and the cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode in the mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Some of you have seen the explosion of Mount St. Helens. Uh, films were made of that as it blew out the side of the mountain and destroyed many square miles of trees, not them all flat. And then in the mud flows that followed, there was a canyon cut that is one fortieth the size of the Grand Canyon in one afternoon. It didn't take billions of years to cut the Grand Canyon. It was a global catastrophic event that happened at the time of the flood, because the flood waters are draining off the earth. Anyway, that's for another time. Here it is. It looks like a volcano on top of the mountain. Did anybody live through that that was on the mountain when Mount St. Helens blew up? No. There was an old man named Harry Truman that they warned, not the president, but that they warned to get off the mountain because they knew it was going to explode and he refused to do so. He's toast. And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount and Moses was on the mount forty days and forty nights. Yes, God used Moses' rod. God had a bunch of other interesting people involved. But you know, God is going to use Aaron's rod again. When there's rebellion in the camp and the rods of the leaders are laid up before God, it is Aaron's rod that budded with almonds and blossoms to show that God had chosen him, even though he was, and we see it from this next incident of the, the golden calf incident, he was a very weak leader, yet God had chosen him. In that particular passage, it's the tribal rod for the tribe of Levi. Aaron's rod represents the entire tribe, showing that Aaron and his family are the divinely ordained priestly leaders, not only of the entire tribe, but of the nation as well, because his is the only rod that buds. That's Numbers chapter 17. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all the princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers, and thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of the princes gave him a rod apiece, and each prince one according to the house of their fathers, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds and blossoms, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. That was one of the things, one of the three things that was put into the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod. It wasn't Moses' rod who ended up in the Ark of the Covenant. It was Aaron's rod. There was Aaron's rod, there were the tables of the law, and there was a pot of manna were put into the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Interesting. Aaron's rod. That's what we first have an appearance of here in our text. Where it's cast down becomes a serpent. And Moses did so as the Lord commanded him. So did he. Remember obedience. There has to be precise obedience when we're dealing with with the things of Christ. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish! They were scared stiff, as well they should be. I think that's probably the kind of reaction that Pharaoh had. We'll look at that in a second in the text. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die, we shall be consumed. Shall we be consumed with dying? What Aaron does with his rod is specified. God says, throw it down before Pharaoh. In other words, that's going to give Pharaoh a personal threat. Do you get it? Throw it down before Pharaoh. Now, other people are present, but he's to throw it down before Pharaoh. Not sort of throw it off to the side so they can see it squiggle out the door there and disappear in the desert somewhere. 
It says, throw it down before Pharaoh. God is shooting a warning shot across Pharaoh's bow. He's giving him a personal threat. It does not say that God ever let Aaron have a practice run with his rod before the actual test day. How would they know that Aaron's rod would work like Moses' rod had worked? I think this was a threat to Pharaoh because we know how Moses himself reacted when his own rod turned into a serpent. Exodus 4. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it to the ground. And he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, probably one of the hardest things that Moses ever had to do, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. <laughs> you know, God was kind to Moses. He didn't say to him, put forth your hand and take it by the head. He could have. He could have insisted that Moses grab it by, by the head or by the neck. He said, take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Precise obedience produces precise results that God wants. We see here there are two different results. First there's human reaction and then there's divine reaction. The divine reaction is God hardens Pharaoh's heart. It says so in the text. When Pharaoh responds the way that he does, God responds by hardening Pharaoh's heart. And God says, you know, I told you in advance, Moses, this is what's going to happen. Don't be surprised by it. It doesn't matter how exciting the miracle is. It doesn't matter how, how you know, scary the miracle is. This is going to be what happens. That was the divine result. But we see the human reaction. Moses and Aaron, this is verse 10, went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so, as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rod. When it says Pharaoh called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they are classified together as the magicians of Egypt in the next phrase. I suspect that Pharaoh probably kind of screamed out that command in a rather urgent voice for the magicians to do something about what had just happened. Okay, you guys, take care of it! You magicians, you sorcerers, get over here! Get, do something! Now remember, those were demon-possessed sorcerers. They were, we have two of them named, Janus and Jambres, who are named for us in the New Testament. We know a couple of them. And they were able to duplicate the miracle. That should be a reminder to us that Satan can counterfeit the miracles of God because he does have supernatural, that is above nature, power. But we need to remember something very important. He does not have omnipotent power. It's supernatural, but it's not omnipotent. His power is always less than the power of God. as proved in our text by what happened next to the snakes of the magicians. They became lunch for Aaron's rod. You know, funny thought crossed my mind. I, I wonder if Aaron ever wondered later, when he was holding his rod, whether or not those other snakes were still inside his rod. <laughs> It swallowed them up. <laughs> They're there somewhere. <laughs> that meant that those magicians also probably had to go back to the magic store and buy some new tricks. But um, eh, I just lost my magic trick here. Um, but it is clear that Satan does have supernatural power, but it is always used to produce deceptive miracles. Satan gets into churches, too just like he was in the synagogues in the days of Jesus. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and it says this demon-possessed man came into the synagogue and Jesus cast out the demon in the synagogue. There are people involved in so-called Christian ministries who have some supernatural powers. Is it from God? Or is it being used as a means of deception? Wish we had time to talk about that. Ran into some of that recently. Satan does have supernatural power designed to deceive. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery 
okay, here's a guy who's involved in witchcraft. And you remember I preached an entire series on witchcraft and sorcery in the Bible. That was a long time ago. If you didn't come to the evening services, you didn't hear it. And bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. That's deception. Satan was pretending to be God through the sorcery done by Sam Simon Magus. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Get the book of Revelation. Revelation 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon the horn ten crowns, and upon the heads the names of blasphemy. The name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power. Now you know that the dragon is Satan, because it talks about Michael and his archangels fighting against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon is the devil. It tells us that in that passage. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Verse 3. Now, is this a miracle? I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Yeah, a fatal wound and a resurrection. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake like a dragon. Where are his words coming from? Not from Jesus, from the dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and caused that the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed. That's going to be the one who tries to imitate Christ, the risen Christ. We worship the risen Christ. Satan says, well, I can pull that one off too. He doeth great wonders, one of the words that is used for miracles in the Gospels. So he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Can you call out lightning? Can you call fire down from heaven like Elijah did? and deceiveth, that's the purpose of this, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Satan can perform miracles. Satan's people who are empowered by him can perform miracles, but they're for the purpose of deception. He had power to those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Interesting, it tells us how the beast is going to be wounded to death and then resurrect. It says, wound by a sword. You know, a number of years ago, I believe it was when I was in high school, maybe it was when I was in college, I can't remember, but somebody had gotten this incredible photograph of a Japanese minister, prime minister, or something, someone in Japanese parliament, who was being killed by a sword. A guy from the audience had jumped up with a big, long samurai sword, and he had it at an angle like this, and the guy who he's going to kill is falling backwards, his glasses are falling off, there are people rushing in from all sides to try to stop the guy who has the sword. He managed to jump up on the platform with it and stab that prime minister. Or whatever position he was, I don't remember the exact position, but I vividly remember the photograph. And somebody had snapped it right at that moment. Revelation 16, verses 13 and following. And I saw three unclean spirits, these are demons, like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's the battle of Armageddon which is coming up there. We get to chapter 19. <coughs> we see it again. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstones. So, can Satan work miracles? Can his demons work miracles? Yes. 
because Satan and the demons have supernatural power. Satan even has power that is greater than Michael the Archangel, Jude 1.9. Yet Michael the Archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Interesting, takes us back to Moses. All the way back there to this incredible man of God who walked into the presence of God in the middle of what we would think of as a volcano. This man Moses, who could hold his rod out over the sea and part the sea, When God took Moses home, he didn't die a natural death. But apparently there was a, a supernatural conflict going on right at that moment. Satan wanted the body of Moses because he knew that if he could get Moses' body, he could deceive the children of Israel. He didn't get the body of Moses. He did manage later on to, to, to seduce Israel. We think of the incident of Balaam in, in the book of Numbers. He did cause them to murmur and grumble and groan and complain until all those who were adults at the time of the Exodus died in the wilderness and only their children entered the promised land. But oh, how he wanted to have the body of Moses. And Michael, the chief prince, according to the book of Daniel, disputed with him over the body of Moses. But even Michael didn't say, get out of here, I'll beat you up. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not, that is, he did not dare to bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. But one other point that we need to make, and our time is up. We do not have to be afraid of Satan and his demons as believers, because the power of God is greater. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you're a true Christian, if you have really believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. God dwells in you. Jesus dwells in you, and Jesus said the Father dwells in two. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is the one that's in the world? It's Satan. You read First John, that's what you discover. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, can Satan use external means to do things to you? Yes, but he can never steal your soul. He can never do anything to you that is not within the permitted and directed will of God. We see that in the book of Job. How Satan wanted to tear Job up. But God limited him. And in the end brought Job to a greater understanding and spiritual maturity than Job would ever have gotten otherwise. And God rebuked all of Job's friends. And then God told Job, pray for your friends. I think most of us as carnal Christians wouldn't want to. We'd say, God, go ahead and smack them. They deserve it. And he did. He prayed for his friends. How much we need to learn in terms of our spiritual growth. Very instructive here. God expects precise obedience so that we might have the precise results that God has determined for his greatest glory and for our greatest good. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you will take it and use it for the glory of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you cause us to apply it in a practical means, in a practical way this day, that we might learn to obey. For obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Father, apply your word to our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is hymn number 581, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Hymn number 581.